Uh, thanks for coming to uh, about midway through I think, our senior presentation. Sydney is our presenter today. Um, we met Sydney for the first time on her first day of her junior year, right? At Valley High School. She's been here for two short years, but I immediately noticed um, that she had a, a particular interest in uh, justice, in things happening in the way that served really your peers. And I noticed you being um, defending on the stance of peers, your sister, uh, in matters that matter to uh, young people. Her project um, takes on the larger justice system and it was really, really interesting. And I just want to mention that the panel that she put on as part of her senior project, I think I mentioned, um, man, it had just a, a strong impact in the larger community. So I wanted you to know that it was really well attended and, and the people there were really passionate about the subject of uh, prison reform and re-entry programs for uh, the people who have gone through the prison system. So uh, let's support Sydney. We'll give her a round of applause. Right, is this an okay volume? So this right here is the American prison population, and obviously it looks smaller here, but that's just because I couldn't fit um, two million little people on this screen. So each person represents 2,300 people, which makes for a um, total of 2.3 million. Uh, this is included in uh, state prisons, local jails, federal prisons, juvenile correctional facilities, immigration detention facilities, involuntary commitment, territorial prisons, Indian country jails, and military prisons. Uh, now, state prisons and local jails make up for the most of that population. Uh, federal prisons come in third place, but not very close. And everything else just makes up for a very, very small percent of people incarcerated in America. So for a better visual, this pie chart uh, kind of shows you a little more what that looks like. You can see that state prisons make up um, well over half of the incarcerated population and local jails take almost, if not a full quarter. It is a very well-known fact that America struggles with mass incarceration. For those of you unfamiliar with the term, mass incarceration basically means we put too many people in prison. As a matter of fact, the U.S. incarcerates more people than any country in the world. Some people say, and you might have heard this claim, that mass incarceration could be ended if we release all non-violent drug offenders from prison. Unfortunately, this is just a popular myth. And for those of you unfamiliar with the term non-violent drug offenders, this refers to people who have not committed a crime against another person or a violent crime in any manner, but were just arrested for possession of a small illegal substance. However, nonviolent drug offenders are only common in federal prisons, and state prisons and local jails are actually much more populated with violent offenders and property offenders than they are uh, even drug offenders, let alone nonviolent ones. So, in order to make an impact on mass incarceration, it stands to reason that we have to start focusing more on serious and violent offenders. Once again, this is 2.3 million people incarcerated in America right here. About 40% of that is violent offenders. Another popular belief is that people considered violent offenders are too dangerous to be released. However, this is another myth, whether or not you'd like to believe it. So let me explain that a little further. First of all, violent offenders aren't what you think. Uh, I would assume that when I say violent offenders, the first thing that probably comes to mind is um, the worst person there is, a serial killer, a serial rapist, people that are so evil they don't show any hope for getting better. Uh, and though these people do exist, they uh, don't represent the majority of people in prison and they are actually nothing like the average violent offender. Many of these offense categories actually group together people uh, convicted of very different crimes. For example, murder, um, 
which is a very serious and crime indeed, it groups together serial killers with people who have committed acts that are unlikely for reasons of circumstance or sometimes advanced age to ever happen again. So while we can agree that murder is a very uh, serious crime, it still um, varies a lot. So a serial killer, not quite the same as someone who kills once or even in self-defense. It also includes offenses that the average person may not consider to be murder at all. For example, the felony murder rule says that if someone dies during the commission of a felony, that is, while a crime is taking place, everyone involved can be just as guilty of the murder as the person who pulled the trigger. For a more specific example, um, if you were acting as a lookout during a break-in where someone was accidentally killed, uh, though this is a serious crime, you might be surprised to find that you would be charged guilty of murder. Of course, violent offenses are not just limited to murder and manslaughter. Uh, the four biggest categories are listed as assault, sexual assault, robbery, and rape. To dive a little more into these, um, or at least the most common, which is assault and robbery, there is simple assault, which is attack without a weapon, resulting either in no injury or minor injury, such as a black eye, some bruises or scrapes. And it also includes attempted assault, so not completed, but just attempted assault. There's aggravated assault, which is an attack or attempted attack with a weapon, as opposed to simple assault, which is attack without a weapon. And aggra aggravated assault um, is regardless of whether an injury occurs at all. And it also includes attack without a weapon when the injuries are very serious. So either a weapon with no injuries or no weapon with many injuries. And then there's robbery, which is including completed or attempted theft directly from a person of property or cash by force or threat of force with or without a weapon, and with or without injury. Assault, specifically simple assault, is by far the most common violent crime. Murder and rape are of course the least common. Overall, the term violent offender represents a very broad category of offenders. Someone who commits simple assault is not the same as someone who commits homicide, and therefore should not be held to the same standards. It's usually a combination of many factors that make someone turn to drugs and or crime. Um, this includes things such as mental illness, growing up in poverty, growing up surrounded by crime, uh, dysfunctional households, lack of support from the family, emotional, physical, or sexual abuse, and past traumatic events. So with this logic, um, it, it assumes that most criminals were victims long before ever committing a crime. In my research, I found that that is most often true. Sometimes this can be hard to remember because we don't really want to feel sorry for offenders. We want to get angry and we want to lock them away and make them suffer. And there are many instances where these feelings are more than justifiable. However, understanding and accepting these hardships is an important step in rehabilitating the offender. It helps us know what they need to get better. In 2006, the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that 64% of local jail inmates, 56% of state prisoners, and 45% of federal prisoners show symptoms of serious mental illness. Uh, as well as this, in 1999, the Bureau of Justice Statistics found that 76.3 of violent offenders had been regularly abusing drugs prior to the arrest. Inmates also tend to exhibit low rates of education and poor literacy skills, which further suggests that many of them come from impoverished communities. Now, there are a lot of components that go into rehabilitating an offender and helping them successfully re-enter society. In my research, I noticed that rehabilitation and re-entry programs typically fell into one of two categories, hard skill building or soft skill building. Hard skills are teachable abilities or skill sets that are easily measurable, such as writing, reading, uh, math, or the ability to use a computer. Normally, you can acquire hard skills in the classroom through books and other materials, or through work experience. Some offenders are already lacking hard skills prior to incarceration, 
but other times, incarceration causes these previous skills to diminish. Programs that build hard skills include things like adult education, um, GED courses where an adult can obtain their high school diploma equivalency, vocational training and job training, which provides an offender with the necessary skills to succeed in uh, the work environment, and employment while in prison, as well as work release opportunities. These all build hard skills, measurable skills. Then there are soft skills, which are personal attributes that enable someone to interact effectively and harmoniously with, with other people, such as etiquette, communication, and listening. Soft skills tend to be underdeveloped in offenders even prior to incarceration. <laughs> Things like substance abuse treatment, independent and group therapy, and cognitive behavioral therapy are practices that all build soft skills. They develop who you are as a person. Cognitive behavioral therapy is a great example of a treatment that has shown a lot of success with serious and violent offenders. So cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT, is based on a theoretical foundation that focuses on how criminal thinking contributes to criminal behavior and offending. For instance, distorted cognition is a characteristic very found in very, very often found in criminal offenders. CBT attempts to change these negative thinking patterns and kind of rewire your thought process. So these negative thinking patterns can include self-justificatory, just word mouthful <laughs> thinking, um, misinterpretation of social cues, feelings of dominance and entitlement, and lack of moral reasoning. So uh, traits that you would assume lead to crime and often do. As stated by the National Institute of Justice, the therapy assumes that most people can become conscious of their own thoughts and behaviors and then make positive changes to them. Offenders improve their social skills, means and problem solving, critical reasoning, moral reasoning, cognitive style, self-control, impulse management, and self-efficacy. I examined the success of five very different programs that offer rehabilitation and reentry services for prisoners. All five programs deal primarily with violent and high-risk offenders and offer more than one type of service. There is the Milwaukee Safe Streets Prisoner Release In Initiative, uh, PRI for short. Many of these programs have uh, quite a mouthful of names. PRI um, offers programs to prisoners who are at least 35 years or younger and male, are scheduled for release within at least six months of community supervision, and have a history of violence or gang involvement. However, sex offenders are not eligible for the program. There is the High Risk Revocation Reduction Program, HRRR. Uh, this is aimed at high risk adults, um, high risk adult male release violators in Minnesota. Now, release violators are offenders who were previously um, released from a state prison, but returned for violating their parole. So some of the elig eligibility requirements include that offenders must be adult males, have at least 150 days of community supervision remaining after release, and to have no new pending sentences or a serious pending charge. There is the Boston Reentry Initiative, and this initiative targets male inmates between the ages of 17 and 30 who reside in Boston and are considered by law enforcement to be at high risk for continuing their involvement in violent crime following their release from prison. The Community and Law Enforcement Resources Together, also known as COMALERT, targets parolees who are eligible if they are paroled to Brooklyn, at least 18 years old, and in need of substance abuse treatment. And last but not least, the Allegheny County Jail-Based Reentry Specialist Program, with, unfortunately, no shorter name. The program included males and females who had been sentenced to a minimum of six months in jail, were returning to the county upon release, and were also categorized as medium to high-risk offenders. As I said before, no program offered just one type of service. That being said, the services they did offer varied so the only service that was offered by all five programs was post-release housing assistance. Four out of the five programs offered court release or employment during incarceration, substance abuse treatment, and some form of adult education. 
The data I found suggests that comprehensive programming has the most consistent success. This means offering an array of services that address both hard and soft skills. So hard skills like education, employment, and housing assistance, but also substance, substance abuse treatment and mental health therapy. Comalert uh, demonstrated the most success, but these results are somewhat skewed because Comalert also works with the largest population of people. In addition to this, I assumed the urban environment in which this program took place probably had a, a reason for the success as well. Obviously, in a large city, resources are more readily available than in a, in a rural or suburban environment. Out of the 448 people that participated in Common Art, only 18% ended up being reincarcerated, which is a total of 82 people. Now, out of 448, I don't think that's too bad. I was able to gain a lot more first hand knowledge of these types of programs by visiting the Wisconsin Resource Center also known as the WRC, uh, it proved to be one of my most valuable resources. The WRC is a facility that was built for state prisoners that are in need of specialized mental health services. It was developed in 1983 and describes itself as a leader in the development of innovative treatment methods. I feel I can attest to that being true after my two visits. The WRC provides services that are hard to find and sometimes completely non-existent in Wisconsin state prisons. Physical and mental wellness programs where participants can create their own wellness plan, learn about maintaining mental health, mental health problems, and understand their symptoms, as well as learn positive coping methods, building support systems, and developing an overall healthier quality of life. There are groups which focus on coping skills, strategies to manage frustration, anxiety, and anger, and challenge mistaken beliefs and thought distortions. They're, they offer a class which provides the student with a thorough understanding of the U.S. court system, a citizen's legal rights, and basic information included in the court system, as well as a comp competency manual necessary to pass the evaluator's exam at the end of the class. There is also a therapy group for individuals whose trauma symptoms are causing significant problems in their daily functioning. Group sessions explore and discuss the impact of violence on their lives and healthy ways of coping with and healing from their past. Up until 2011, the Wisconsin Resource Center only treated male inmates, which for the most part makes sense, since 93% of the Wisconsin prisoners are male. However, in 2011, the Resource Center opened its services up to female inmates. A new wing was added to the original building, and that new wing is now referred to as the Wisconsin Women's Resource Center. I toured the Women's Resource Center and, in the process, got to speak with two of the current residents. Let me first note that the average violent offender is not female. 76% of all violent offend offenses are committed by men. So although the stories I heard from these women don't represent the majority, I believe they're still very much worth sharing with you all. I am not at liberty to share any real names, so I will call the first woman I spoke to Amy. Amy was arrested for armed bank robbery and sentenced to 10 years in prison. She has, uh, at this time, about three years left. Amy committed the robbery to get money for drugs uh, in order to feed her long-term addiction that she was struggling with. Amy says the environment she grew up in played a big role. Both of her parents were in and out of prison, along with older siblings. When I spoke to Amy, she had only been at the Resource Center for two months. She was on a waiting list for two years before she could finally come. I asked her how the Resource Center compares to the prison that she came from, and she said, the environment... I'm sorry. The environment is a lot quieter, and days are more structured. She receives a lot more attention and is always accounted for by the staff. She also gets to participate in a lot of the classes and groups that aren't offered at the prison. She told me that at the prison, there is no mandatory way to spend your days. But at the WRC, you do have to undergo certain treatments and programs in order to be there. This wasn't the first time Amy had been incarcerated. She first spent 18 months in jail 
uh, before ever going to prison. When she got out uh, on parole after those 18 months in jail, she went back to living with her family. She told me that she believes returning to that toxic environment is the reason her parole was unsuccessful. Within months of being there, she started using drugs again and ultimately turned back to crime, committing that armed robbery. However, this time, she landed in prison, not just jail. Amy told me that when she gets out of prison in a few years, she's not going back to her family, even though this has been a difficult choice for her. She's going to stay in a transitional living facility for the first few months of her release and then hopes to support herself. Amy has saved up money by working three jobs while in prison and plans to get a job as soon as she's released. Having this money saved up is going to give her a huge advantage and it's going to make it much easier for her to get back on her feet. Amy also has a 12-year-old son who she hopes to develop a better relationship with when she's released. The next person I spoke to I will call Teresa. When I spoke to Teresa, she had actually just come back from a cooking class, which is one of a few incentives uh, for when enough funders show good behavior at the WRC. Teresa was originally arrest arrested for battery of an emergency services personnel. Uh, this means she assaulted a medical professional who works in the emergency department, like a first responder, emergency medical technician, or an ambulance driver. Teresa was sentenced to two years in prison. Her sentence is going to be finished in June. Teresa has been in and out of jails for most of her life, but this is her first long-term incarceration and her first time in prison. She also has a history with drugs and alcohol, more so alcohol abuse. In fact, Teresa told me she was so drunk at the time of her crime, she has no memory of it happening at all. Teresa had been at the resource, for, resource Center for one year when I spoke to her, and she told me she's changed a lot since she got there. She described her therapy and incarceration as a blessing. She says she needed removal from her toxic environment, similar to Amy. She now participates in a lot of addiction and trauma therapy at the WRC. Teresa told me that instead of being put in and out of jails for most of her life, she could have used a lengthy inpatient treatment program for addiction. She doesn't believe prison is the answer for dealing with addiction and mental illness. Treatment is much more ideal. When Teresa first came to the resource center, she was dealing with severe anxiety. Her anxiety was actually so severe that she was terrified of talking to anyone, and for a while she just wouldn't speak at all. Now she says she hasn't had a panic attack in months, and her anxiety no longer gets in the way of her daily life. When I met Teresa, she was soft-spoken but very friendly, very different from the person she said she used to be. Teresa told me that when she's released, she plans on attending uh, Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous groups, as well as outpatient treatment where necessary. She also told me she plans to take Vivitrol. This was the first time I had learned of Vivitrol. So Vivitrol is a medication taken in the form of a monthly in injection. It helps to reduce cravings for drugs and alcohol. And it does this by blocking endorphins from binding their response to receptors in the brain. So in other words, it kind of disassociates that good feeling with being drunk. Teresa told me she feels motivated to do well after release. She said she likes being sober and plans to stay that way. When Teresa is released, she plans to live with a friend who has been her most reliable support system throughout her time in prison. Teresa expressed a lot of gratitude for this friend and told me she's been a very good influence. Her friend has been sober for a long time and doesn't have a criminal record. Aside from my very valuable experiences at the Wisconsin Resource Center, my panel discussion was probably my most memorable life source. Uh, of course, as some of you are familiar, in late January I decided I wanted to host a panel discussion. Uh, however, this was not the first time the idea had come to mind. I had first had the idea early this school year, but initially pushed it out of the way because I thought it would be too much work. Of course, when it presented itself again in January, I was hesitant, to say the least, but I knew I would have to decide it then if I was going to go forward with this. I couldn't wait any longer. 
So I committed to the idea, I moved forward, and I started making plans for my panel discussion. Starting the process was probably the most difficult part. At first I sent out a couple dozen emails to potential panelists, and I only got a handful of replies. It wasn't even until mid-March that I had five people agree to be on my panel. As soon as this happened, I started pushing flyers everywhere, putting them up everywhere that I could. Uh, and immediately after, I made a Facebook page for the panel discussion. It got a huge response. The prison reform community in Wisconsin is very big, but also very tight-knit. Everyone knows everyone, and information travels very fast. Hundreds of people who I had never met started sharing this event with their friends. And I was even surprised to find that it had been published in the newsletters of a few local prison reform groups. One woman named Beth Kelly Miller reached out to me after hearing about my upcoming event. Beth makes quilts commemorating the names of people who have lost their lives to addiction, are currently struggling with addiction, or are sober and in recovery. To have someone reach out to me like this was very exciting and I quickly agreed to have her quilt in my event. When the big day rolled around, I was frantic and nervous, even though the weeks leading up to it had been calm for the most part. People expressed a lot of interest for the event online, but I wasn't sure they'd actually show up in real life. About 10 minutes before 6 o'clock, which is when the panel was scheduled to start, people started pouring through the doors. Back in January, when I started planning the event, I was hoping for 30 people, and uh, more than 100 actually showed up. The discussion itself went very smoothly, and I somehow managed to keep it all on track. The panelists made some beautiful points and were responded with the audience very well, and we only ran a little bit over time. <laughs> After the panel, when refreshments were served, um, Beth's quilts drew a lot of interest, and they added such an element of professionalism to the event. You can see an image of her quilt right there. And that was only one of three. This was easily one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. And I'm still surprised that I managed to put it together all on my own. Aside from this, a lot of my project process was documented via website. So, in August, uh, before school even started, I built a website because I was so excited to get started with my senior projects. Um, I originally scrapped the whole thing, uh, gave it a makeover one or two times, and ended up looking the way it does now. I have a little bit of experience designing websites, and I'm pretty happy with how this one looks. Uh, of course, making it look nice wasn't the hard part at all. Actually using it consistently using it as I intended a tool for documenting my process, that was by far the most difficult part. In fact, there were several weeks at a time throughout the year that I would abandon the website completely and not write anything. In the end, though, I managed to publish at least one article a month, and I found this to be pretty impressive considering I'm not a big writer. I wrote about a lot of things. I documented many of my live interviews. Um, I reflected about where I was in the project process. I talked a little bit about politics, history, and I even played around a little bit with multimedia formats, uh, videos, images. So as you can see here, I uh, have, this is a few months worth of writing. Um, and it keeps going. I also included an about page to talk a little bit about my project. This was a very helpful tool for meeting new life sources, um, an easy thing to direct them to so they could learn about Valley New School and my project, my intentions, what I was doing overall. I also have a timeline where I outlined the project process. And I talk about the anatomy of the project a little bit. Overall, at times throughout this project, um, things got difficult. I had the job of playing devil's advocate, which definitely challenged and evolved my own beliefs. 
However, I've developed a much more thorough understanding of the American correctional system and the law that upholds it. However, more importantly, I would say I've developed a more thorough understanding of moral ethics, which have made me come to realize that the law isn't always definitively right, especially when it comes to punishment. So at this time, I'd like to invite the audience to ask any questions, um, if that's all right. So what is the difference, difference between a jail and a prison? Um, jails are typically used for short-term sentences. Um, I don't think anyone stays in a jail for more than two years total. Prisons, of course, can be up to life. So typically used for more serious offenses. Laura? Um, I know that like as a junior, it's hard to come up with a senior project. So what made this, like, were you sure that you wanted to do this, or did you kind of have to, like, choose between a few different things? Okay, so Laura asked if, uh, how I came up with this idea, essentially. Uh, during my junior year, I had, I think, about three, um, three big ideas for what I wanted to do. Um, I don't remember exactly how I ultimately came to this. But I knew then um, that I wanted to pursue some sort of career in criminal justice, so I think that made it a little bit easier. Addie? What are your plans for the future? Uh, what are my plans for the future? So next year I will be attending the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Uh, as of right now, I'll be studying criminal justice and political science, although that could very well change, as you often see with college students. Um, I'm also very excited to work with some of the prison uh, reform groups that I've met throughout this project, since a lot of them are based in Milwaukee, such as um, EXPO. Um, I worked with a lot of people from EXPO, that stands for Ex-Incarcerated People Organizing, they're a really cool group, among others. So. Sophie? How did you, like, really realize, like, where you want? Well, actually, in the beginning of the year, um, as I mentioned during my uh, presentation, the claim is there's a popular claim that releasing all nonviolent drug offenders from prison will end mass incarceration. Um, early in my research, I found out this wasn't true. Um, and then the first thing that came to mind was what about violent drug offenders? And quickly after, I found out that those aren't a majority either. So this project, actually, and if you look at my website, you'll see, it started out as the effectiveness of rancher programs on violent drug offenders. Um, a few months later, I dropped the drug offenders part entirely and just started looking at violent offenders because they are a much larger population that often don't get the same attention. Um, does that answer your question? Yep. Mr. Demay? So your comparative study of the five programs, uh, that was stuff you had to go out and find how, what were the challenges or where, where do you find that information? Um, there was one website that I, uh, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but the website was dedicated to uh, documenting different um, prison programs, both inside and outside, so um, rehabilitation and reentry programs. Um, it, what was hard was finding the ones that were either targeted towards violent offenders or worked primarily with violent offenders, since very few efforts exist towards violent offenders. Um, there are many more programs that exist for nonviolent offenders, since, in a sense, they're kind of the low-hanging fruit. Um, in addition to that, it was it was a challenge at first to be able to understand um, that form of writing, technical um, 
like dissertation style of writing. I'm not used to reading with a lot of numbers. Um, numbers in general are kind of a roadblock for me, but I eventually was able to get past that to understand what the data meant. Um, yeah. Mr. Demay. Sorry, speaking of numbers, so mm -hmm. um, cost of, of those programs, like, did you, did you spend much time looking into that? That seems to be like the biggest barrier to getting the program started. So. Um, I did look at it some, and I, I suppose the biggest thing I found was that although they do um, have substantial costs, it's costing more to keep people in prison especially uh, considering we have more people in prison than we can afford. Resources are already stretched quite thin. I don't have any exact numbers off the top of my head, though. No. Ms. Lukey? Can you name, in your opinion, some key items for everything from prevention to reentry that would resolve this issue by and therefore lower incarceration rates? Um, I believe redefining violent uh, crimes would be very beneficial, as I mentioned. Um, it groups together a very wide category of offenders. So although there are people um, like serial killers who, and serial rapists who commit very heinous crimes and probably shouldn't spend their lives in prison, they somehow end up falling under the same category as um, someone who you know, beats someone up a little bit on the street. You know, b both bad, but severely different levels of bad. Um, I think first redefining uh, violent offenses would be beneficial. Something else I found very surprising during my research was that when um, offenders are put back out on parole, they are returned to the same community that they came from. So, obviously, uh, their community is usually a huge reason for them committing crimes in the first place. Uh, putting them back in that toxic community, uh, surrounding them with crime and um, poverty, even if they have gotten better in prison, makes it really difficult to stay better. So I feel finding ways around that. Um, maybe abolishing that rule altogether would, I think, make reentry and rehabilitation a lot easier. Ace? Um, that has changed several times in the past year even, and I can't say it won't change again <laughs> um, after me standing here in front of you. Um, last year I looked a lot at social work, um, working one-on-one -on -one, uh, in ther therapy environments um, with prisoners, things such as that. I'm now thinking that I want to work with a larger population, so I've started looking at political science as an option, um, maybe policy making. Uh, something that overall allows me to have a larger effect. Ms. Kozlowski? It seems like, uh, from what you've said, um, and, and from what some of the guests at your panel talked about, that fear and myth you know, are playing a huge role in this process, or uh, in the mass incarceration piece. Uh, do you have suggestions or ideas about how to combat that? And, and maybe a, a, along with that, how, is that really an issue? Is, is, the fa is our fear of a, a violent offender being released in our neighborhood playing into this as much as it seems? Um, yeah, it certainly is, because uh, that fear is preventing a lot of people for you know, giving their advocacy and support uh, for perfect, perfectly reasonable ideas because they're too scared that it would be a threat to them in their, um, in their neighborhood. Um, there is a lot of stigma surrounding released offenders, um, which in a, in a lot of ways I can't argue with because it's only natural for, you know, families to want to protect themselves. But at the same time, um, there's certainly an element of ignorance. Um, if you really have done your research and you have reason to be scared, then be scared. But uh, if you hear that someone is getting out of jail and coming to your neighborhood, don't just you know, start crusading for them to 
be put back in the hole. Um, learn about them, um, why they went to prison in the first place. Um, as far as the stigma, I, I don't know. There are a lot of people that, it, for them it's easier to say, just put them all away, and then nothing further. Um, I wish there was an easier answer to that. Oh boy. Um, <laughs> Mr. Froke? Um, is there a factor of wanting or being ready to be rehabilitated versus not, and does that show up in success rates? Yeah, actually, um, a lot of studies have shown prisoners know their own needs and have the desire to receive these programs. Of course, that is more true with nonviolent offenders. For violent offenders, sometimes it's a little more of a struggle. Um, I even realized that talking to Amy and Teresa, um, both of them when they came to the WRC immediately, they were like, get me out of here, I don't want to be here anymore. And uh, then they calmed down a little bit, and now they're both doing really well. So. Um, for a huge majority, um, people do want to receive these resources, but they can't because prisons don't offer them. Yeah. Laura? Um, what was your favorite question you asked at your panel? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> That's hard um, because that discussion went many ways that I couldn't plan for, which is, well, I guess what I was hoping. I was hoping they would kind of take it away. <laughs> Um, I was surprised by what the judge said. Um, it's very interesting to hear a judge from your own community talk about these problems. Um, and although I don't remember what question his answer was associated with, something that surprised me was when he said there are actually a lot more sex offenders that we don't need to be afraid of in our communities. Um, you know, like a lot of instances where it was a 19-year-old boy and a 16-year-old girl or something, um, hearing a judge say that we don't need to be afraid of people um, is interesting. Um, usually I would think that a judge would be uh, advocating for anyone <laughs> to be locked away if they've committed a crime, since it's kind of his job. Ms. Lukey? Did you find any places, you said America was the number one incarcerating country, the places that have the least incarceration, is it a good place to be and why? Um, so I think as you could assume, like uh, the Netherlands are very well known for their successful prison structures. Um, they're definitely built more like a uh, rehabilitation center, um, like a hospital even. Um, of course, the Netherlands beats us out on a lot of things. Um, <laughs> um, so, something I noticed at the WRC, because uh, I got to look at some of the rooms, actually all of the rooms, um, the inmates are allowed to decorate. They have privileges that they don't have in the state prisons, and that's because they are. The, in, uh, the staff wants to give them the opportunity to create a safe space because most of them, when they're at the WRC, are going through trauma treatment. So they're reliving past events that probably caused a lot of damage and led up to them being where they are now. So giving that ability to express their feelings and have a safe space, um, even in a facility that is for prisoners, was surprising. Um, it also showed a level of control you wouldn't expect because you think usually you can't have anything in prison because suddenly it's a weapon or it's a danger. Um, but everyone I met had complete self-control and uh, obviously you have to have self-control if you have these privileges of having a little TV in your room and um, pictures of your family on the wall, things um, that we do in normal life. From what I've seen, the Netherlands has structures similar to that. Um, their prisons don't look like prisons. Um, they don't use punitive measures such as solitary. Um, and overall, they have many, like, fewer people being convicted of crimes in the first place. So it's a lot easier for them to provide those resources for the few people that do go to prison.
one tip that I would give to attorneys having to work with people in these situations. Um, since I have not gone to law school and I don't know the um, and I don't know the exact requirements of working with uh, offenders either pre or post release, I don't think I'm in the place to give advice to anyone exactly. Um, but you know what? Check back with me in a few years and maybe hopefully then I'll have something. <laughs> Miss Lukey. Uh, one theme that seemed prevalent at your panel was that everybody up there said that prisons make prisoners worse. Mm. That that's true, right? Like I, I mm. assume that every every prison that I see is just making the situation <coughs> worse. Um, with the way they're built, <laughs> usually. Um, I was surprised to find that a, I, I already knew that prisons in Milwaukee were highly segregated, but so are others throughout the state. So that already, uh, you know, that's like a DIY race fight. Like, that's how you turn people against each other is by segregating them. Aside from that, um, <laughs> when you put the wrong people with the wrong people, they're essentially teaching each other how to be better criminals. <laughs> so, of course, if we had less people in prisons overall, this wouldn't be such a problem. It's a whole, you know, like, never-ending loop of things that happens. But um, they probably wouldn't have such a negative effect on people if we didn't put them away for so long. Um, even drug offenses, even nonviolent drug offenses uh, can be, like, 10, 15 years for possessing, like, this much of an illegal drug, which is bad, yes, but you probably shouldn't go away for that long. Um, because in the end, they're, yeah, they usually come out worse for it. And when they come out, you know, their next crime might not just be drugs. Ms. Kozlowski. Um, I was wondering if your research included how reform programs actually get started. So does it come from within a government entity? Are there people within the prison saying, you know what, we could do this better? Or... Is it outside groups that are um, getting things started with private money, or are there other routes to doing that? Um, a lot of it is nonprofit and faith-based groups. Uh, I think government-funded programs are a little harder to find. Um, even one of our local programs that has shown a lot of success, circles of support or circles of strength or whatever it's called, they just got their funding cut completely. So who knows if they'll even be in existence. Uh, during this project, I got to work with um, someone, I think also named Teresa, not affiliated with the alias I used. Um, her and a group of others, they were uh, creating uh, a reentry program, essentially, and I've had the opportunity to work with them, uh, I guess, be a part as they develop that curriculum. Um, so they have put together uh, classes for different topics, um, finances, um, you know, anger management, just different things that are necessary for success. And they built this completely on their own. So it's, um, yeah, it's cool. A lot of times people just see the need and they, they do it. Um, from what I've seen, uh, not much exists in state prisons, so it's most often not the government's doing. Mr. Froke. So, um, in order to change things meaningfully, we have to be politically, I would think, um, to, and so, like, some political uh, power politicians talk about these issues in this way, but my experience over time has been more like, get tough on crime and, and so forth. So how do you go about um, changing popular opinion about this issue so that it can be cool to reduce the prison population? <laughs> um, I, there's a way of looking at people in prison, and I don't know how I found myself doing that, and I don't know what the switch is that exactly makes people look at others uh, with this compassion, but 
reminding yourself that they're your neighbors, um, that they come from the same places as you. They're sometimes your kids, your friends' kids. Um, they're, they're part of the community, and the goal is to want them to get better, not to punish them. I'm, when we dehumanize them, it makes it more difficult all around. Um, if I was going to try to sway a big population, I'd probably use religion. Um, that would, I, I think, be a, a way to convince a lot of people. Um, you know, do good because the Bible says so. Things like that. Um, if you want an incentive, it, we're spending a lot of money on our correctional system that could go other places in the country. Um, education, if you want to say military, you can say military, whatever you want. Um, rationalize it however you want um, in the end that you're, you know, supporting the cause. Um, yeah, people have their different reasons, but I don't know. Um, if there was one way to convince everyone, I think I, I would, but I don't have it. Mr. DeMay. What did you learn about yourself as a facilitator for this big public thing? What were your takeaways or strengths and improvements? Um, I, well, luckily the, uh, and I reminded myself of this because it kept my sanity, um, the panelists were the star of the show, not me, and that made it a lot easier. Um, I don't know, uh, I, I think being capable of facilitating all those people, that's something I've never done before, ever. Uh, especially people I've never even met with face to face. Uh, I think like three out of the five panelists I had never met face to face. I hadn't even spoken or communicated with the judge, only his secretary. Um, I've learned I'm capable of doing that, and that was surprising, and I'm still a little surprised by it. Is there any other questions?